idea to choose the cast lab drive through uh, STEMI case presentation because uh, 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 during COVID-19 uh, in Jeddah and in our hospital, there is significant decline of uh, STEMI cases. And uh, this is because all the patient, uh, they are uh, uh, really uh, afraid, afraid to catch the coronavirus from the hospital. So this is very nice flyer, uh, as uh, Dr. Haider mentioned in his comment before the meeting, that the patient afraid to come to the hospital, uh, there is uh, a lot of heart attack and a lot of strokes. And uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19, as you know, the, recommend, the recommendation from the guideline uh, to give thrombolytic therapy, and then you can uh, do rescue intervention. But actually, this is a, a strategy failed because they found a lot of complication uh, due to delayed revascularization. And as you know, all of you, uh, if you will compare primary VCI versus lytic therapy, so uh, all the meta-analysis showed significant uh, uh, reduction in mortality, uh, revascularization, and hospitalization in patients who are treated by primary VCI. So all the guideline was changed again. Uh, sorry, not the guideline because uh, it's not guideline, it's a recommendation. So the recommendation it changed again from all the uh, guideline to proceed for primary BCI during COVID-19 era with maximum uh, uh, BBEs for all health care workers, not only the doctors, but also all whole care, uh, health care uh, worker dealing with the STEMI patients. So we used this flyer and uh, our plan uh, to translate in, in Arabic and to be distributed for all patients that if you have heart attack or stroke, please come to the hospital and the hospital have very strict protocol to protect the patient and health score worker during uh, STEMI and acute stroke intervention. Our patient today, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Akawi, uh, uh, 33 years old, uh, he was presented to our hospital uh, on September 1, 9, 10 uh, in evening time by typical prolonged chest pain. Actually, he developed this, this chest pain while he is in a Starbucks getting his coffee and drive through. So this is another reason to choose uh, a radial drive through. He developed the severe typical prolonged angina uh, and a Starbucks uh, drive through in El Medina Road, very close to our institution. He asked for help because he was in the middle of drive through. He asked all the cars in front of him, please, I want to go. I have severe chest pain. Uh, actually, he did mistake. He drived by himself and uh, uh, he went to our hospital and our hospital very close uh, to this uh, Starbucks shop. Once arrived to the car park, uh, he became sweaty, uh, severe agonizing chest pain and he arrived to the emergency department and the ECG was done in the emergency department and showed this finding. Sinus tachycardia, heart rate 95 to 110 beat per minute. And uh, there is mild early takeoff of SCP segment in the inferior leads. And you can appreciate here a single ventricular ectopics and mild ST segment depression in V2 and V3 indicating early uh, uh, ischemic changes in the inferior and posterior wall. Actually, the chest pain was continuous. We preload him by uh, uh, Tiga Grilor 180 milligram and aspirin uh, 300 milligram, and uh, we give him 5,000 uh, intravenous and fractionated heparin. 10 minutes later, while the chest pain is ongoing, the ECG was repeated and showed full pictures uh, uh, fulfilling all the criteria of inferior and posterior wall myocardial infarction. So actually our plan to proceed for primary BCI actually in our hospital, uh, uh, Erfan Hospital in Jeddah, we have the primary BCI uh, protocol since 2007. So the system will establish the for STEMI patient to everybody aware by the protocol. And we have quality indicator for uh, the primary BCI since 2007. So we decided primary BCR. So the question now, because we are in radial course, which is ideal approach to do femoral approach or radial approach? Actually, if you will ask the default femoral operator, he will tell you, I will do radial, uh, femoral approach. 
And uh, uh, if you will ask him why, he will tell you historically cardiac catheterization and uh, 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 via femoral axis, uh, it's historically and everybody aware and well trained for the femoral axis during uh, cardiac catheterization. Femoral axis remain necessary in multiple diagnostic and interventional setting rather than coronary intervention. Femoral axis has been associated with low vascular axis site complication and it is estimated about 2% to 6%, uh, but also it is associated with prolonged hospital stay and uh, 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 some data showed there is some mortality in femoral approach, but actually uh, uh, this mortality, it is related to the training because if you will ask all of us, if you have any mortality from the femoral axis and you are well-trained in femoral axis, I, I'm sure, the answer of all of us, it will be no. Nobody confronted with mortality due to vascular axis complication via uh, femoral artery in the one who, will, who trained well in uh, femoral axis. Femoral axis can be jeopardized by obesity, severe atherosclerosis, and anticoagulation. And here, the most important, femoral punctures require a specific training and the constant practice. Again, if you will ask the radial, uh, 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 default radial operator, what your axis you want to do, he will answer you, I will do radial. And uh, because the radial axis for diagnostic and PCI reduce bleeding complication and reduce mortality and STEMI uh, data uh, related to cardiac catheterization and increased patient uh, comfort. First uh, radial, uh, the first described uh, by uh, Canadian cardiologist, and his name is Lucien Cambio in 1989, radial axis definitely has modernized the field of intervention cardiology and has become the popular approach for both trainees and experienced operator. This is the late professor uh, Lucien uh, Cambio, and uh, uh, unfortunately he died in uh, two, uh, uh, 2010 and at age of 83 years old, he is Canadian and he is the one introduced the uh, radial axis. So what is the Cambio radial paradox? And this is very important. I want to concentrate about this one. Cambio radial uh, paradox, it was prescribed in this very nice uh, uh, review articles which was published in Jack 2015. And the, the title of this uh, uh, Cambio radial paradox, the benefit conferred by radial axis for cardiac catheterization are offset by a paradoxical increase in the rate of vascular axis side complication with femoral axis, not with radial axis, with femoral axis. So you are well trained in radial axis. And if you want to, to switch to femoral and you are not well trained in femoral axis, definitely the vascular side complication, it will be high if, if, even if you are well trained in the uh, femoral axis. They did two periods analysis, the historical cohort group, and this group, they are used only femoral axis for uh, uh, diagnostic and BCI, and the contemporary cohort uh, in period from 2006, 2008, and this for the one who will train in radial and switched to be trained in femoral. And we found this very nice data. There is significant increase in vascular axis site complication in uh, 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 femoral contemporary cohort if you compare it with historical cohort. And also there is significant increase in the vascular axis site complication in historical cohort if you compare it with overall contemporary cohort. And if you compare it with femoral contemporary cohort, definitely, definitely all of us, we agreed the lowest complication rate, it, it is going with radial axis. And if you see here, this is in diagnostic and therapeutic cardiac catheterization. And you can appreciate here in adjusted and adjusted analysis, the B-value significant, uh, it's going with uh, uh, historical better than contemporary femoral uh, 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 vascular side complication rate. And this is the final radial or cambio paradox. High rate of vascular complication, it is estimated about 12.5% in femoral artery access by default radial operator. Although radial approach may reduce vascular complication rate 
at an individual level, it can paradoxically be associated with increased rate of complication at a population level due to greater number of complication in femoral axis patients. So the existence of this radial paradox should be taken into consideration, especially among the trainees and default radial operator. This is very important. It's not one axis. If you are well-trained and you are default radial operator, you have to train your fellow about the, red, the femoral axis, because if you straight away going to the radial and you are leaving the femoral, if you will switch your vascular, local vascular complication, it will be high. But if you are well-trained in radial and femoral axis, definitely the vascular complication, it will be very low. So back to our patient, uh, the patient we explained for him that he have high risk STEMI and we need to, die, to do primary BCI. And he agreed and he signed the consent. And actually he asked it by himself to do it uh, radial because he want to go from the hospital because he is afraid from uh, COVID-19. So uh, this is a very uh, uh, nice uh, uh, demo for anterior puncture technique. Actually, I am performing uh, all the radial cases using the anterior puncture technique. And you can appreciate here the needle and the in the radial artery. This uh, actually, I got this from the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Haider and Dr. Samir uh, Banchuli. And this is a guide wire and uh, we inserted the guide wire. And here I will tell you, this is a point uh, uh, 30.035 uh, guide wire. Look for the tip of the wire here while I'm advancing the wire in the radial artery. I'm asking all my assistant all the time, don't push against a resistant. If you feel resistance, please stop and let me know. So we found the resistant and we found the tip of the guide wire. It changed the curve from J to acute curve. And uh, there is here cerebral four possibility, which is radial artery spasm radial toshwaski, radial artery loop, or bigger curve of diagnostic wire. I mean, the diagnostic wire curve, it's a three millimeter diameter. And this is very nice hand demonstration by Dr. Banchuli. You can appreciate here the guide wire curve is three millimeter diameter and the radial artery two millimeter diameter. So if you will put curve at three millimeter diameter in artery three millimeter diameter, the tip of the wire can engage one of the muscular branch and can lead to perforation. So uh, immediately I decided to remove the guide wire and I used the uh, workhorse PTCA wire and you can appreciate here the guide wire went smoothly up to uh, the subclavian artery. And after that, it's going to the ascending uh, aorta. And here you can appreciate the guiding caster. Uh, um, in all STEMI patient, really, uh, I'm uh, using only guiding caster, not diagnostic caster, because I don't like to change all the catheters uh, uh, diagnostic to guiding and setting of STEMI. In our patient, there is two infarcted uh, related artery from the ECG. So I consider the, third, the left circumflex its target and the, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, right coronary target and most probably the LED uh, target. So I went to buy the guiding caster and this is an EBU 3.5. And you can appreciate here, there is every now and then the guiding caster uh, uh, flipping in uh, the aorta, uh, flipping up in the aorta. So in this case, uh, it is recommended don't change the curve of the caster because this is the right curve. It's uh, only related to the technique of the cannulation of the left main. So uh, uh, I tried uh, to use the step wire and this is the flipping uh, up of the tip of the guiding in the aorta. And by good, by good, by botting the uh, 0.35 uh, uh, extra stiff wire, not protruding from the tip of the caster, you can successfully cannulate the uh, left, uh, uh, left main or right coronary if you will use right coronary artery. And this is the back end of the uh, 0.35 wire, but the most important here, don't push the guide wire outside the tip of the uh, guiding caster. And this is uh, by pushing the guide wire, you can uh, change the, th the, sa the shape of XP or EBU guiding caster. And this is after cannulation. So actually I use the guiding for the guiding caster for the uh, right coronary artery. And you can appreciate here critical subtotal occlusion 
uh, right coronary artery and from the ECG, this is the first uh, culprit and uh, we crossed by uh, sign blue work horse wire and I did pre-dilatation by 2.520 uh, uh, balloon at was smooth with dilatation. So this is uh, air in the balloon, sorry. And this is after balloon dilatation. And we used uh, 3026 uh, 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 guide, uh, sorry, uh, drug eluting stent with uh, maximum inflation uh, pressure, uh, 20 ATM. So it reached about 3.4 millimeter uh, in diameter. And this is a uh, pot, uh, sorry, this is a stent post. And this is uh, immediately after stenting in uh, the right coronary artery with grade three distal temiflow. And you can appreciate excellent myocardial blush without staining, indicating good uh, epicardial and the microvascular uh, perfusion. So we went to uh, the left coronary by the EBU after the technique of cannulation because it's flabbing out, uh, up in the aorta. And you can appreciate here there is a, a critical LED lesion, one non-significant diagonal branch. And the lesion here, it's a, a bifurcation Medina uh, a 010. So I decided to guide, to wire the diagonal, to wire the LED and to uh, use professional stent, stent technique. I used the 3 uh, uh, drug eluting stent and we used the, the diameter of the stent based upon the distal uh, LED diameter, it was three and approximate 3.5. So after deployment at the nominal uh, pressure, there is complete expansion. And uh, we uh, pulled the guide wire uh, from the diagonal branch and we did both in the proximal up to 20 ATM. So the uh, diameter, stent diameter proximal was around uh, 3.4. And this is the uh, immediate angiographic outcome uh, for uh, the uh, LED after, sorry. So this is a bot. And this is the immediate angiographic results. Uh, no dissection proximal, no dissection uh, uh, distal, and the grade three distal flow in the diagonal, post diagonal branch. So uh, I, uh, 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 did ECG post procedure and you can appreciate a normalization of SCT segment and there is no any residual anginal pain and the beauty here, the outcome. The outcome here, this is morning after the procedure, completely normal echo, normal left ventricular systolic function, normal left ventricular diastolic function, no mitral regage, no wall motion abnormalities. This is short axis. And this is uh, RV, uh, uh, tricuspid valve flow, mitral valve flow, aortic valve flow. Excellent uh, 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 saving uh, uh, procedure for the heart. And this is immediately after the procedure, you can appreciate here the puncture site after removing of the TR band in the morning. And this is focus on the uh, vascular axis side. And th this is a uh, video with focus on the vascular axis side. So the patient was admitted uh, in September one, discharged September two, three morning, and the total hospital stay 36 hours. And uh, we decided to discharge him home because there is no arrhythmias, no ECG changes, no chest pain, and normal LV systolic function. Actually, I saw him last week in my clinic, and I did double X. Uh, and this is routine. I'm doing to see if there is any radial artery occlusion or not. And uh, you can appreciate the Doppler signal. It's excellent. And uh, I got this uh, very nice uh, uh, slides from Dr. Uh, John Wang from uh, MedStar Union Memorial uh, Radial Curve uh, drive through I hope we can, by using radial approach, uh, to reach to do a very fast uh, radial intervention uh, via radial axis. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Abdul Masood. Uh, it's a very nice, interesting case. Uh, I would just like to remind you with one fatal complication that might occur in uh, not 
frequently, but not infrequently in the femoral approach. Uh, and we have uh, talked to the people before and told it to the junior staff uh, how to puncture the femoral artery. And we reminded them, don't get a high puncture because hypotension occurring after diagnostic coronary angiography may be fatal if retroperitoneal hematoma on the hemorrhage occurs. So yes. retroperitoneal hemorrhage due to a high up femoral puncture may be fatal and that's why we should uh, remind ourselves to this complication. Thanks, Abdul Masood. I think uh, we will have a lot of questions, but uh, we are eager to hear uh, Dr. Haider and uh, talk to us about the toolbox and radial approach. So, uh, so I, I, I will stop. I will stop my share now. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was a beautifully done case and a great outcome. Um, I'll try to um, pick up here, and uh, here we go. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, hopefully uh, some of the equipment that I will mention here. It seems like it's all available um, uh, on your side of the world, and uh, and I will uh, try to kind of tell you um, our experience on how we do things transradially um, and which equipment we use, and uh, kind of hopefully I can be able to touch base on certain. Um, uh, problems that you will probably face and how to tackle them safely without causing any problems. Um, now, in terms of picking radial versus femoral, uh, we teach oral fellows here uh, how to do radial first, which means we do um, uh, uh, tell them to start with radial if they can. Um, however, in many cases, a safe femoral axis uh, just like what Dr. Alam just mentioned, in a good spot right on top of the femoral he head and preferably using ultrasound guidance to see where the needle is entering. Um, it's, it's probably as equal uh, as a uh, transradial approach in terms of the bleeding complications. Um, but for the sake of this, I'm just gonna kind of go back and touch base on certain things that Dr. Gennady already mentioned. Uh, how to, um, uh, these are questions I faced growing up in the field when I was a fellow, when I was a junior faculty, I always wanted to understand why certain people do through and through, which is almost forbidden or it's not favorable if you wanna go through the femoral because you don't wanna have that posterior arterial stick and a fear of a retroperitoneal bleed or a pseudo aneurysm formation. But at the same time, to do an anterior wall puncture in a radial artery that is um, 2.5 to three millimeters in diameter, becomes a bit challenging and require much of experience. So I always wanted to know what's the difference and can I safely do both in the radial, um, in the radial uh, site. Spasmolytics are very important also, and I will touch base on what spasmolytic you use and an anticoagulation as well. Um, this is, these are the same slides uh, these, that I actually adapted from Samir Penchuli, made some adjustment to it. This is the technique where you use counter puncture. The needle here is different than the usual needle that you use. Um, so this needle actually, it's needle covered by an angiocatheter. So it's almost like you inserting an IV, an intravenous line into an artery. So you approach it, you approach the artery, the anterior wall, you go through, you see a feedback flash of blood coming back, you know, so you know now you're luminal. And then you, um, you um, purposefully, so you will push the needle even further to puncture the posterior wall to lose the flow. So you do this on, pur on purpose. This is not the cell danger technique. This is not the anterior stick. This is the counter puncture. So now you're out of the artery posteriorly, and then you take the needle out. You are left with the microcatheter. Then you pull the microcatheter back and slightly downward um, to make sure that it doesn't kink at the side of the skin. This is the problem, you don't wanna do this. So you wanna pull back slowly and then drop uh, your needle. Once you do that, now the tip of the catheter is luminal. And that's why this is somewhat favorable for certain operators because you know for sure you are inside the lumen. And once you advance your wire, you know your wire will just fly inside the, the lumen, not dissecting the anterior or the posterior wall of the artery. And once that's done, you send your microcatheter in and you're done. Is there a difference between those two? There is no difference. This is the RAID trial, which looked at a comparison of almost equal number of patients, 210 on the, on the cell digit technique, which is the anterior stick, 
And then on the modified cell digit technique, which is the counter puncture, there is no significant noted in complications or radial artery occlusion. RAO here means radial artery occlusion. Um, now, which one you prefer? I don't think there is, uh, I don't think there is cons because it's radial. Uh, I do advocate radial access for all patients. Um, but if you want to do both, certain people say, you know what, there is less trauma when you do counter puncture, despite the fact you puncture the posterior wall, you know for sure that when the wire goes in, it's not going to dissect, um, which is more, one of the reasons you, you will have radial artery occlusion after you remove your catheter, if you created some dissections going in. Certain people say, why would you puncture the posterior wall if you know you just want to go to the lumen because now you might bleed into the posterior wall, creating a compartment syndrome, which is, which is pretty much a very, it's equal to retroperitoneal bleed because it's a very, um, it's associated with a high risk of losing function, especially if you're using the right hand, most people are right dominant, uh, that becomes an issue. So you, you gotta pick your technique, standardize it, be efficient in it. And if you use ultrasound, that's even better. And that's what I do for almost all my cases um, especially if I'm using a guide catheter that's bigger than six French. Um, I, we learned here that the left hand, if it's not holding the needle, uh, the left hand should be holding the ultrasound probe in every single thing we do, even with pericardiocentesis. So uh, moving forward, we can always talk. And, and if you guys don't have access to materials for ultrasound, more than happy to provide. Ultrasound is, is a game changer in access and in procedural, especially now with us being uh, penalized for, um, for every single complication that happens. Spasmolytics, people have different ways of doing spasmolytics. Certain people give nitroglycerin, nitrates, through the sheath. Certain people use calcium channel blockers, and that could in include nicardipine or verapamil. Um, the two differences between both of them, with nitrates, uh, you have a short onset of action, which means you put the catheter in before the patient feels it, you already um, induced vasodilatation. So it's good. However, it doesn't allow you much time because it will wash out quickly. And that's the problem with the short um, on, uh, acting and onset and offset. With a calcium channel blocker, probably you have a slower onset of action, but eventually you will be covered for a longer period of vasodilatation that would probably allow, allow you to switch guides, change catheters if you have to, or even if you tackle a problem, you still have some vasodilatation. In my practice, I use nacardipine um, in, in a dose of 500 microgram um, before I um, um, insert the, the catheter. And at the end of the procedure, I will give another dose of 500 microgram of nacardipine, then remove the sheath. Um, there are multiple trials talking about this. The, the, the main technical aspect of this is to mix the medication with some blood back from the sheath. These, these two medications are um, acidic. They have low pH than the blood, and they usually turn to burn. Um, and if they burn, the patient will feel it. You will actually counterintuitively induce spasm because now the patient is aware of something in the radial artery. So I do advise that you mix it with some blood or use a bigger syringe and mix it with some normal saline to just dilute the, um, the pH. Now, for all diagnostic, it is recommended to, um, this is not interventional, this is diagnostic and geography through the radial approach. It is recommended that you give some degree of anticoagulation. People usually use 50 units of um, unfractionated heparin, um, uh, not to exceed 5,000. Um, that's, that's 50 units per kg, I'm sorry, not to exceed 5,000. Uh, certain people do give the heparin through the sheath and through arterially. Certain people give, give the um, heparin intravenously. Again, in my practice, I use intravenously. The reason is, uh, two, two reasons for, for this um, decision that I made. Um, first, based on this trial by Samir Pinchuli, there's no difference. So the effect is there. However, we looked into data that talked about, again, heparin is highly acidic. It's 4.6. The pH of heparin is 4.6. Um, and for that reason, if you give it intra-arterially, you will induce spasm that you just try to prevent. That's number one. And the, the reason we're giving heparin is to, to prevent catheter thrombosis, which means you are looking for a systemic effect of heparin, not necessarily local effect at the wrist side. So why would you give it intra-arterially? What I do now, because I tackled many 
subclavian brachiocephalic um, tortuosity, and certain times you won't be able to make it to the heart, I would give the heparin the minute I see that my wire and my guide is approaching the ascending aorta and I'm in a safe place. The reason I do this in a training program, if I want to switch to the groin, I will be more comfortable sticking the groin myself on fully anticoagulation. But maybe my fellows are not well enough trained at, that, at this moment in the academic year to do that. So for me to prevent sticking a groin with a, um, or transfemoral with full heparinization, I wait until I make sure that my, my arch is clear and then I will give my intravenous heparin. Now, let's dive into what diagnostic catheter we use. I don't know what's available in every single institution back, in, back home in the Middle East, but I would, when we first start doing radial, um, and, and uh, Dr. Mansour probably will talk about this. Um, we always went left radial. And the reason why we went left radial because we are used to the Judkins catheter and JR4, JL4 work terrifically from the left. And then we said, you know what? Why go crazy? You are in the left, you stick the catheter in, it simulates the right groin or the femoral approach, and then, then you're done. But then the the, 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 the body habitus, the, the rate of obesity in the westernized world is way higher than what we see back home. So now the question becomes, you are getting a lot of radiation, you're leaning forward, what, what should we do? We came up with a radial um, approach um, and that's what we've been using, at least in my practice, 98% of the cases I do right radial. Now when I'm doing right radial, you can still use the Judkins catheters from the femoral. The only difference you need to use is use a a, a, a 0.5 smaller size on your left side of things. On the right coronary artery engagement, JR4 will get you any place or a 3DRC. But if you are trying to engage the left main coronary artery, if you're using JL4, you should probably use JL3.5. That will have a better seating, more coaxiality and no roofing into the left main. Then we, we said, you know what? For, if I use transfemoral, that means I need to exchange the catheter twice. And if I made it already down with some tortuosity, I don't want to lose my position. So I either use a long J wire, an exchange wire, to make sure I always maintain position at the cusp, um, or let's come up with something that will even minimize the exchange. Each time you exchange, the people talked about the risk of increased stroke, you, you're driving by the right common carotid. So why not just cross it once? If it's a diagnostic case and you're done, you used one catheter and you came out. And if it's an intervention, guess what? Instead of using three catheters, two for diagnostic, one for intervention, you're gonna be done with two. So that's when the tiger and the jackie. The problem with the tiger and the jackie, you could see them on the side. The tiger is a modified Judkins. If you can imagine, it looks like a JL4, but it has this extra bend or extra curve. The Jackie is a modified Amplatzer. It's, an, it's a modified AL1. Now, my recommendations early in the curve, trying to masterize a Tiger catheter is safer than the Jackie for the risk of dissection of the right coronary artery. The Amplatzer are very notorious in an untrained hand to cause dissections of the right coronary cusp or the right, or cause spiral dis dissection down the right coronary artery. So safest um, and probably a bit easier learning curve is the tiger. And that's what I use in the training program here at the uh, Georgetown University and the Washington Hospital Center. Now, let's talk about guide catheters. You're done with your diagnostic, you found a mid LAD. In my practice, I used transfemoral an EBU35, an XP30, an XBLAD. Um, there are multiple catheters. These are Medtronic catheters that I just mentioned. Boston Scientific makes uh, different catheters, the MAC catheters, they have CLS, they have many, many other um, names. There is actually a Tiger catheter, which is similar to your diagnostic, but it's a bit um, stiffer. It has the guide characteristics and feature of being braided uh, with, a, with a very atraumatic tip so you can do your intervention through. And also there's the, the Ikari. The Ikari has is, is, been around for many years because it was a single diagnostic transfemoral when it was first came out, but, now, but nobody adapted it because everyone was used to use JR4, JL4 from the groin 
very easily. So why try to learn something new? Uh, use one catheter, it doesn't provide much. Um, but then Ikari modified its own um, um, design and created a transradial. And if you see on the third picture here, he added an extra. I actually met him in, in Liverpool um, probably seven years ago. And I asked him, why did he add this extra bend? That extra bend was to accommodate for the brachiocephalic entry to the ascending aorta, because that will bounce you out of the arch right here. So you will be um, done with the case. So that's available. That's also a very good approach in cases what Dr. Maksud just showed us. If you're planning to do two, cul two culprits, a Chiari catheter or Tiger catheter might be a good option for you. Single axis, you know it's a STEMI, you know you will need to, to do a PCI. Why not just go with one catheter and manipulate to two coronaries and do intervention? Um, it's a bit expensive, so cost becomes a bit of an issue here. Again, in my practice, I don't do that. I do what Dr. Maksud did. I either go with the diagnostic to the non-culprit and then go with the guide catheter to the culprit um, or just uh, do two guides. For cabbage, now that's another issue. Um, for cases that comes to our institution with an already defined anatomy on an angiogram, and I know I need to intervene, I'm not gonna lie to you, I use transfemoral. The reason I use transfemoral, not because we don't know how to do transradial, and that's because of the size, I usually like to probably use laser, etherectomy, a bit more advanced therapies before you deploy a stent, and for that reason, I would rather to have a seventh French or an eighth French. And usually if you're, if you're working with, an, with a radial artery that has a diameter of less than 2.3 millimeter, a seventh French becomes a very problematic. You will have a lot of issues and you might cause perforations or dissections as you go through. The minute you cross the brachial artery, things are safer. But to tackle the radial and going up with all the branches, you might cause um, trouble that you don't want to deal with. That's why I go transfemoral. I don't shy away from transfemoral if it's a graft um, intervention. So now this is a, this is a very um, elegantly put a trial um, because it actually answers some of our concerns. I'm gonna highlight two things. So this is using gradial versus femoral to access vein grafts. There's no lima here. There's no internal mammary, whether right uh, internal mammary or, or left internal mammary. This is only for vein grafts. And they found that actually you use less catheters if you're radial. And uh, obviously you're gonna use more heparin, which we talked about. We knew I'm gonna use heparin because I give heparin even when I do diagnostic. But they found that the, you use less catheter, which, which means it's gonna be more cost effective. Um, and it's pretty much, you know, if you, if you know where the graft is, and I will tell you the proposal of the catheter I use, and then I would be done. So, um, so why keep trying? Oh, give me this. No, give me that. Oh, you're lucky if the surgeons left you a marker where they put the graft, but many surgeons don't. They just stick the graft and you have to kind of go guess. And then you have a patient with a creatinine of 1.5, 1.2. They have GFR of less than 60. And now you don't want to use contrast. So you don't want to fish. You want to go in, find the problem and fix it. So probably radial is a bit favorable to do diagnostic. Uh, and again, in my practice with intervention, I don't shy away from femoral. And obviously you're gonna send patients home early. SDD stands for same day discharge because that's what, that's the protocol here in the United States to send everyone, especially in uncomplicated cases to um, home same day, even after intervention. So if you're on the right radial artery, can you do the Lima? That's the main questions that we always get. Yes, you can. Does it require more technical? Yes. Does it, is it governed by what type of arch, aortic arch you have? That's very important. In cases when we have bovine arch, this becomes very hard. And we learned this because when we use, when we use TAVI, when we change valves, we put distal embolization devices, which means that you go through the right radial artery and you put meshes inside the cerebral arteries to capture any debris comes when you replace a valve. And if you have a bovine arch, it becomes a hell of a case, it becomes very hard. But you can still reach the lima. How are you gonna reach the lima? Technically, I could, if you close your eyes now and imagine how many times you come from the right radial artery 
and you end up in the descending aorta. I bet you many times. And what do you do? You ask patients to take deep breaths and you try to redirect yourself to the ascending aorta. When you're trying to engage the lima, I want you to go to the ascending aorta. I don't want you to go to the root. I want you to exit. Once you exit, you can flip your catheter back, counter clock, and that will phase the catheter up to the subclavian. To do that, you can use a JL4 or a Jackie. And the minute you get there, you probably can use your J wire or a bit stiffer wire with a flimsy tip, not an amplage wire, not something very you could stop someone with. No, you need to use a good body wire with a very flimsy tip. Once you are in the subclavian, that wire will create a track across the chest. Then you bring your internal mammary catheter, which is pretty much a modified um, Judkins right, but with a almost like a hook bend as opposed to a very straight bend like a JR4. And then you can get the lima. Now, if I want to hook a graft that goes to the right, AL1 or AL2 or AR1 or AR2 coming from the right radial, I usually use AR2 and I have minimal trouble engaging a vein graft arising from the right side of the aorta and reach the, um, um, especially if I'm coming from the right radial. Now, right coronary bypass, RCB, um, it's another one. Um, it's technically a JR4 with an extra bend that will kind of bounce you off the um, brachiocephalic trunk. If you are trying to engage a vein graft to the OM or the diag, which arises from the left side, then you can use AL1 or AL2 or JR4, believe it or not. However, I just told you this, that's why I use an amplatzer to go in. Because again, that's one catheter that will allow me to engage both sides of the graft, whether going to the circ diag or whether I'm going to the right PDA. If you're coming from the left or the distal left, which is the snuff box, anatomical snuff box axis, then the lima is better engaged with an IMA or you can use a 3DRC if the um, diameter of the subclavian is big enough. If you're trying to, you, to engage a vein graft to the right PDA, then a multi-purpose catheter, pretty much a straight catheter, can take you to the right side of the aorta. If you were trying to use an SVG, engage a vein graft to the OM or the diag, then back to AL1, AL2, or even Tiger or Jackie can reach and, and give you the um, full. You should save this picture in the cath lab. Um, I have it in, in, in my cath lab. I'll tell you why this is important. You're coming right radial. If your graft is arising here, a Judkins right or a multipurpose will engage you, even if you're thinking about, about guides. If, if your graft is arising in the gray area, not the striped area, this gray area, then you use amplats or Judkins. If it's high up here, then an amplats that's usually bigger and you have to prolapse it to look up. So you need to see the swan neck, the swan neck of the amplats. That's when you get the high position right here. If you're coming to the left, if, if your graft is here, multipurpose. If your graft is here, then you can use an amplats or even JL4, multipurpose, whatever you like to use. This is a very important one. It was brilliantly done by um, Brizuto. So in summary, that's what I do. We use radial approach for bypass grafts. Um, if it's, you know, intervention, if feasible, um, most I use transfemoral, against because, again, because thinking of complexity of intervention, um, I would prefer left. Um, I get more radiation, but it's probably easier. And then it's always good to pre-plan, especially in bypass um, interventions. So that's what we use. These are the catheters that I use in the lab. I come left. For the Lima, I use a 3DRC or IMA. Then I switch to AL1. I'll get every single thing. If I'm lucky enough, get the left side of grafts. If I'm lucky enough to get the right with the AL1, that's what I will do. If not, I'll switch to an MP1. Now, this is something we wrote up and then will be published soon um, in the um, uh, Cardiovascular um, uh, Intervention Journal uh, for Society of Cardiovascular and Geography and Intervention. Um, I don't wanna kind of bore you with it, but this is almost like an observational study that, that picked my attention when I was in training and I, after I graduated, I start collecting data um, as, I, as I go through practice. If you're coming transradially and your J wire, this is a J wire, this is an 035 J wire. If the J wire makes this configuration, 
which simulates an elephant head. Do you see the picture? Do you get the idea? If you see this, the chances of you finishing the case with a universal catheter like Tiger becomes very hard. You will end up using a lot of contrast, more radiation, provoke more spasm. So what we recommended, again, I don't wanna bore you with data. I'll show you more practical things. What you need to do here, if you look, if your distance from the catheter or the elephant head to the trachea, less than one centimeter, you don't have to measure it in the case. You're not gonna de-scrub, go measure and come back. But just by visualization, if you see that it's hugging the trachea very closely, then you can finish the case with a universal tiger catheter or Jackie catheter. If it's more than one centimeter from the edge of the trachea, the left edge of the trachea, you won't be able to engage. You will, you will, I'm, I'm sorry, you will, but you will spend a lot of time, a lot of contrast, a lot of spasm. So we propose, if you see this configuration of an elephant head, engage the right coronary artery with your universal and immediately switch to a Judkins left system. Whether a 3.5 or a 3 or a 4.0, that's up to you. We recommend 3.5 because that will just sit in the cusp and you look to the left main coronary artery. So I kind of urge you, if you see this, don't give up the transradial and switch to the femoral. Not yet. Give it one more shot, especially if your institution carries universal catheters. If you're already going in, as I told you, with a JR4 and a JL35, you're golden. Nothing's going to happen to you because that's what I'm recommending to you. But if you are with a universal catheter, give it one more shot. This should also be in every cath lab recovery and holding area. I can't tell you how many times this saved me. This is unrelated to, to the catheter selection, but I think having a full understanding of this, um, what type of hematoma, what do you need to do for each type? It is vital. It is vital for your uh, uh, maintenance of a radial program. You don't need to freak out. You don't need to call surgery. You don't need to go nowhere if you are in type one or type two. You truly don't. You all need to do put another TR band, watch it, lift. You can read this through it. You can raise your, your hand, ice packs, but these type one and type two, they will always resolve on their own. And some Motrin, sorry, some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and then you'll be fine. When it gets to level three, uh, that becomes shaky. You need to be more vigilant. You probably need to send your fellow to check on the arm every 20 minutes, uh, because the minute you cross, the, the, the forearm compartment into the elbow compartment biceps, the case is done. You need to call vascular surgery. And if that happens, the risk of compartment syndrome and loss of function of the hand becomes almost imminent or inevitable. So uh, this, is a, this, is, this is not mine. I did not create this. It is taken from the Canadian institution. For some reason, the Canadians are way ahead of us in radial. Uh, as Dr. Maksud uh, presented, Dr. Kampu was actually the pioneer. So, um, but this is a very important slide. Now, how am I on time? Am I taking longer than I should or do you want me to stop? No, no, you can continue, Dr. Hedges. Okay, so again, don't want to bore you more. Um, now you're in the guide, you are in the aorta, your wire is in, but your guide catheter is not going anywhere. What do you do? This is what's known as the razor effect. That's when the guide is way bigger than your 035 wire and the guide is not tracking. Dr. Maksud said it early in his case. When the wire doesn't go, you don't go. When the wire stops, you stop. You go nowhere. You don't. Pushing is not the answer. Finesse, motion, try to understand why the wire is not going before you start pushing. Number one, if the guy doesn't go and the wire is in already, you need to give more sedation and you need to give more spasmolytic and give it time. Wait, wait a bit longer and a slightly bit longer. Usually spasm will, will resolve. Um, whatever catheter you have, I'm sorry, whatever wire you have, you can ask for a support catheter. They should be available in, 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 in all institutions. These are old catheters we use for peripheral. There's no... Um, it's, no, it's not new technology. And then you have a technique called balloon-assisted tracking. 
which I kind of touch base quickly. It's very cumbersome. It's time consuming. You don't want to go there. And then you have Cordis Railway. I don't know if that's available in your institutions, but therefore I'm not going to go in details on how to do that. But I will show you what to do technically. This is what I, oh, I'm sorry, video is not working for some reason. Anyways, I'll tell you, wire is trying to go up, wire didn't go. What do you do? Push the wire, you have three options. Push the wire, I just told you you don't. Abort your case and exit, say heck with it. Let me go ephemeral. Listen, I'm very good in ephemeral, why not waste my time? Or do something else. I picked do something else. The reason I did pick something else, I said, you know what, let me give it one more shot. I told you, it's always deserve one more shot for radial. Don't give up quickly. I took a picture and in the picture, I saw severe spasm. My next technique was exactly what Dr. Maksud did. I gave up my 035 wire. I used my workhorse wire, a wire that I trust in the corneries. So for sure, I will trust it in the radio. Then I tackled my way through, but I still couldn't bring the guide in. These two dots you see here, I'm so sorry, I don't know why this didn't work. It's a support catheter. It's a catheter, you can use any support catheter. All you're trying to do, I want you to imagine the thinking. You have a thin wire, then you have a layer of a micro catheter, then another layer of a guide. That's what we call here the mother and child, which means you're just trying to transition the discrepancy between the levels into three layers. Once you do that, the guide will fly. You'll have no problems. Balloon assisted tracking or BAT, uh, it's technically, you have an 014 wire, you bring a balloon. This is a coronary balloon. For a six French, you can use a 2.0 or a 2.5 balloon. Usually I use 20. Why? Has two markers. I can stick 10 millimeters out, 10 millimeters stays in the guide. This is exactly what I just explained. The only thing, it is very, not very cumbersome, but this is multiple steps. So if you, if you don't have the micro catheter, use the balloon. If you, don't have, if you have the micro catheter, don't use the balloon because now you have to switch, go there, bring balloon, inflate. But all you're trying to do is to transition the guide and the wire. These are the sheathless guides. These are the kits that we have in the United States. One is made by Asahi called the UCath. One is made by Cordis. Um, uh, I think I, I exceeded my time. There's no, there's technically a dilator, a hydrophilic dilator that you could send um, and then make this transition a bit smoother. Do you see this difference? You can see it in the lab tomorrow or today, when, uh, tomorrow. Early in the morning, put an 035 and a six French and you will see the gap. This gap cut through the radial artery when it goes up, especially if there's tortuosity. That's why we need to minimize this. We need to kind of mold it into a way that it looks like it's a cone instead of a step up and step down. Anyways, it comes in flavors. And I think that will be the end of my presentation. I can save you this for a different day. If you have it in, in Egypt or any part of the Middle East, I'm more than happy to explain to you how it's done, but that's technically, let me see if I have another slide before I, uh, not, not really, this is, uh, this is it. Thank you for listening, and um, I apologize if I took longer than I should. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hashem. I'm very proud of you tonight. Thank and you. And I realize that madaris al-ilm wal-shaar wal-fiqh fi al-kufa wal-basra ma zalat hayya bilugh akhra fi makan akhar. Thank you. Very much. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, you. you are very welcome. So, uh, so please uh, stay with us. And uh, I think we have a lot of questions for you. Sure. Okay. Can you start, Mansoor? Sanah, <clears throat> you see my slides? Yes, yes, Mansoor. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل صلاة ونسك ومحيا ومات الله رب العالمين. It gives me pleasure and joy to share you the 15th session of Al Azhar radial course. I would like to welcome you all. 
And thank you, Dr. Heather, for accepting our invitation to join the uh, course. And also, I would like to thank him and Dr. Maksud for these marvelous talks. For new attendee and Dr. Heather Al Azhar radial course is an educational case based dedicated course aims at uh, mastering radial approach. In the last sessions, we discussed uh, many issues, including the detailed the vascular anatomy from the digital arteries until the coronaries. And the last sessions, we discussed in detail how to start a successful transradial program that relies mainly on three domains that should be fulfilled. All of them should be fulfilled. Any defect of one of them, definitely you will have unsuccessful program. The first of them is the cath lab setup. That includes nurses text beside the traditional catheters and the dedicated catheters that Dr. Hashim told us about them right now. Second, the important issue, how to choose and take care of your patient, proper preparation of your patient and the choice is very, very important to have a successful program as well. And third domain is the you as interventional cardiologist, the radialist, radialist, itself, radialist himself, that should be have the knowledge and the skill as well to have a successful program. The main domain that the, our the transradial access provides superiority over transfemoral approach in terms of safety, better patient satisfaction, as well as quality of life, driven mainly by early ambulation. And for us, is there a difference between right and left transradial approach? in terms of superiority and superior outcome. This will be our tonight's discussion, inshallah. To choose between the two approaches, the same three domains should be applied as well. Proper cast setup, proper choice of your patient, and you have a, have a knowledge as well as skills to manage such situation. <clears throat> uh, exactly as Dr. Uh, Haider mentioned right now, okay, the most of the cardiac and the most of cardiac catheterization is usually performed via right radial due to standard configuration of catheterization laboratories. In the right radial approach, an arm board is placed securely below the mattress, and the patient arm, as you see, rests on board, and the operator performs the entire procedure from the right hand side of the patient exactly similar to the transfemoral approach without any change in the cath lab setup. But with the, in the modern era right now, with some few modi modifications, the, we can approach the left side of the patient from the right side with many comfort, with no problem at all, exactly similar to the right side. By placing a custom arm here in this area, Custom arm made of foam or pillow material attached to the left side of the table to elevate the left upper arm of the patient and to direct the arm itself to the midsection of the body. By these uh, modifications, I think I can work from the left hand while I am sitting without disturbing the configuration of the setup or the, of the cat lab. So definitely at the modern era, cath lab setup doesn't differ in both right or left uh, transradial approach. Does the operator experience play a role in left or right? Definitely it is not because we are using the same kits, same devices with no problem at all. So I think the radial, radialist experience doesn't play a role also to choose between right and the left approach. So what does make a differ between the left and right approach? In this nice uh, study that demonstrated the radial anomalies are very high. Okay, this situation or this paper in this study included 1,500 uh, patients. The rate of radial anomalies was approximately 13%, with majority of these are due to high radial takeoff. <coughs> in the literatures, it is mentioned clearly that okay, the radial anomalies range between 13 and 25% of situations. Uh, this nice script illustrated the vascular anatomic differences between the right and the left approach in 610 patients in whom coronary angiography was performed twice, one from right and one from the left. And they compared the arterial variance, arterial anatomy between both uh, approaches. Could you please mute yourself, uh, Dr. Samah, or uh, all the other uh, attendees, please? And this uh, paper clearly mentioned that in 75%, the anatomy was normal. And in 25%, anatomy was abnormal. 
variant anatomy in the radial course. Out of this 25%, 11% were conf conf conferred only to the right anatomy, right, right abnormal anatomy, in which the right arm or right pathway was associated with anatomy, and the left, no, was zero. And in other 6.6%, the left anatomy was conferred only to the left side. However, there is substantial difference between the right and the left in which the usually the right anatomy is more dominant in the uh, compared to the left one. And in 7.5% in this paper, they found that the variant anatomy was bilateral with high tendency toward similarity between the uh, variant anatomy in which if we have a radial loop, we will find a radial loop in the other situation. And more importantly, they found in this paper in 610 patients, high origin was dominant or more uh, dominant in the right as compared to the left, significantly higher incidence of the radial loops as well as the atheromatous, atheromatous or subclavian anomalies like sub, subclavian artery uh, tortuosities, maybe. Arterial spasm was not different between both of them. Okay, coming back to, to my uh, paper, our paper from our group that we uh, assessed the difference between the anatomy in both right and left. In our paper, aiming at reducing crossover from radial to femoral, we, I proposed the RURU approach. What does it mean? RURU first R stands for the right radial approach. When I find a resistance or uh, failed to get the radial artery or advance the wire for any reason, I will switch on to epilateral ulnar, right ulnar. If there is a problem or I fail to get, I will go to the left radial, then left ulnar, uh, left ulnar approach, aiming at reducing crossover to the femoral to what we did find. We did, this is, a, this is a flow chart of our study, there is no problem, but I would like to present some of these cases or real cases just to confirm what we found from our, in this paper. This is an octogenarian lady, hypertensive, diabetic, obese, and short stature, presented with a chest pain. ACG and echocardiography proved evidence of ischemic heart disease as well as severe mitral regurgitation. And the coronary angiography, as I mentioned, default approach from the right radial approach. So I found the resistance in the subclavian uh, innominate axis. However, there are some tortuosities that I could easily overcome by asking the patient to take deep breath. And there was a tight lesion in the LAD. Okay, I would like to change the uh, catheter to the right uh, Jotkin, but unfortunately the patient got agonizing arm pain and we found the resistance to advance the wire. So selective injection proved evidence of many problems here. There is intense radial artery spasm. There is high take of origin of the radial artery. Radial artery is very small, markedly tortuous artery in such situation. Exactly as Dr. Uh, Haider mentioned right now, I have experience in balloon assisted tracking that I could cross. This is a balloon assisted tracking. I used two O balloon and we could advance and we could reach to the uh, subclavian or the axillary artery and documenting the origin of the radial artery, which is very, very high. Almost there is no, um, there is no brachial artery. Both ulnar and radial artery originate from the axillary artery and we could cross and we found as well as expected octogenarian lady or patient, okay, there is significant subclavian tortuous. But unfortunately, the patient experienced intense spasm and agonizing pain because of the artery was very, very small and crossed over to the left, uh, left radial after failed radial uh, right ulnar approach. So this is the left radial. There is intense spasm, as you see. The artery is very small as well, but it is not that the normal origin. It originates at the cubital fossa, and the artery is small, but however, it is a little bit bigger than the right radial approach. So what we did, I could cross by the, uh, my workhorse wire, which is a safe, usually it works very well. And we found also marked left subclavian tortuosity. However, we could also cross and we continued our procedure. And this is the right coronary artery and the patient sent for surgical correction of both valve and uh, coronaries. So what, and regarding this patient, what are the differences between the right and the left? 
in the right, we found intense radial artery spasm. In the left, there was as well intense radial artery spasm. We found high peak of radial artery, normal origin of the from the left side. In the right side was very, very small. In the left, it was small, but I think it was a little bit bigger than the right side. The artery in the radial artery was markedly tortuous. It was straight in the left. Subclavian both were tortuous. However, we could cross in both uh, tortuous. This patient, I have this, seen this patient today in my private clinic for better understanding of the differences between the uh, radial coronary axis. It is better to divide the, this axis into four segments, the forearm, arm, subclavian innominate segment, and the arch and the ascending aorta. Just look for this patient who is 50 years old patient, diabetic for two, for two years. What did you find in this X-ray, in this CT scan? The right subclavian artery is normal, but just look for here, the axillary brachial artery is totally occluded. Looking here, just to look here, concentrate, the left subclavian artery here is almost, there is a pipe proximal lesion. Continuing here, okay, there is a brachial artery lesion as well. However, we can see brachial artery, we can see the radial and the ulnar artery. Look for here for this patient, there is no flow here and I couldn't feel the pulse, I couldn't, I couldn't measure even blood pressure from the right arm. Okay, so just I would like to describe this patient as well to share with you this 67 diabetic ECG echo proof the evidence ischemic heart disease. I went from the right radial approach. There was no problem in the advancing the wire or puncturing, puncturing the radial artery or advancing the wire and I reached it to the coronary. There was a significant uh, proximal or mid LED lesion. So also while we are advancing or preparing the left guide, we found this very long space, very long high tick of radial artery. Again, we have experienced how to overcome by the balloon assisted tracking that we described the last session. And we could cross, we could reach to the artery, we documented the problem, and we reached ballooned and distended the left radial or the LED with satisfactory final result. When we are coming back, we injected the axillary brachial artery, documenting very high origin of the radial artery, which is very small artery, and this artery usually highly spastic artery. So definitely, the clinical importance of high radial takeoff usually associated with very long space that is usually resistant to extra vasodilatory cocktail, usually associated with high incidence of tortuosity, usually that adds insult to the injury and may be associated with or reposes for perforation as well. And in rare situations as well, we may have accessory radial artery. This is accessory radial artery, which is very, very small and high prone for the space as well. So definitely high tick of radial artery, the incidence is higher in the right side as, as compared to the left side. Usually it makes a difference. So high radial artery takeoff is much less incidence in the left as compared to the right. Another patient, 60 years, slim, hypertensive, diabetic, presented with high risk non SP and refused to get the coronary angiogram from the groin if we needed. But what we did, okay, so puncturing the right uh, radial artery was no problem, but advancing the wire, there was a uh, obstruction to the advance of the wire, and we identified this 360 uh, degrees loop. We punctured the ulnar artery, okay, it's a lateral right ulnar, but because of the significant tortuosity of the subclavian artery, unfortunately, unfortunately, we couldn't cross, we couldn't reach the uh, coronary. So what we did, we crossed to the left side and we identified another loop, radial loop, which was typical, like identical, like the left radial loop. So this is the right and this is the left radial loop. Again, it was a problem to cross the uh, loop. And fortunately, we could get the right, the left ulnar and we completed the procedure DCI to the LAD. So in the previous sessions, we highlighted tips and tricks how to straighten the radial loops. And I think beyond our scope and I think we are short of time. So definitely radial loops as well make a problem 
when you decide to work from right versus left radial. Left radial loop is associated with loops as well, but the incidence is less as compared to the right side. Radial tortuosis as well, I think the higher incidence of the radial tortuosis that make a resistance to advance your wire and the catheter also is higher incidence. All these anomalies in the forearm may impact your success rate when you compare the right as compared to the left. Despite in, in many of the situations we can overcome the, all these uh, problems, however, there is higher cross over rate with more radiation, more catheteric exchange to overcome all these problems and usually associated with less satisfaction. In the arm and the brachial axillary segment, is there a difference? I would like to share with you this patient as well, 84 year old male patient presented with a segment elevation by current function at 2 a.m. And the default approach was right side. So we found this picture as well, totally occluded brachial artery. So immediately we crossed to the right groin, but because of the significant tortuous as well in the right, as well as left iliac arteries, we couldn't reach coronaries. So we crossed over to the left radial and we found a significant lesion in the mid brachial artery. But it was an easy task to tackle this issue and to cross the, uh, the significant lesion to reach the coronary and they found high thrombotic burden and stented nicely. Okay, so usually the brachial segment is associated with less problems, but sometimes we have localized spasm. Sometimes we have diffuse spasm like this patient. And sometimes we have a pseudo lesions or concertina effect like this patient. However, the incidence of these uh, problems usually, as I, as I noticed, very, very, very less. And usually because the radial brachial artery is straight and the larger artery, usually it doesn't make a problem for transcatheter traversing. So usually the brachial segment usually doesn't make many or a lot of problems. Subclavian and anomalies. Does it affect the right versus left? Okay, so I think we can discuss together. Working from the left side, when you are traversing to the coronaries, you may, you may face one resistant point at the junction of the left with the arch, left uh, subclavian artery with the arch. If any tertiary or calcification here, usually you may find the resistant point requiring some skills to overcome as compared to two points from the right, working from the right side. The first resistant point you will find at the bifurcation of the innominate artery to the right carotid or the right subclavian artery. And second resistant point at the innominate junction, innominate arch junction. Any tortuosities or calcifications also, you, so you have two. And take care, if you have a problem in the, or you injured the innominate artery, you may uh, make a problem and the stroke incidence. These are two points, but just look for this patient. I tried to cross, but I found the resistance for this 57 year old patient. So injection revealed or proved this peculiar picture. This is a bovine arch, bovine arch, in which there is a common trunk that gives origin to both left common carotid and the innominate artery. So in such situations, you have to be very, very meticulous. So I use the horse, the, uh, the BCA wire to cross meticulously and I reached my destination and I did coronary angiography. So in these situations, I will have, or you will have three resistant points working from the right as compared to potential one resistant point when you work from the left uh, radial artery. And the bovine arch, the incidence is not uh, small. It is reported in many literature to be approximately 7%. In our situations, you will have a bovine, bovine arch better that may disturb the uh, catheterization from the right uh, radial as compared to the left radial as well. And in one paper, they proved the evidence, meta-analysis proved the evidence that stroke incidence is higher when you work from the right as compared to the left uh, radial. We highlighted in the previous sessions the normal anatomy of the subclavian in both right and left. And it mentioned the clearly that there is a smooth arch or a smooth curve of both subclavian arteries. But in some situations we may have, we may have marked or significant tortuosities. In actual fact reported in both right and left, but reported to be approximately two fold increase in the right as compared to the left 
subclavian artery in patients less than 80 years old. And then approximately six times in the right subclavian artery as opposed to the left subclavian artery in patients more than eight years or octogenarian patients. This tortuosis may result in significant catheter bend. Sometimes it, they may result in the catheter kink and it may result in complete knot. This may have a problem in our situations and they make a problem. This patient is a 57 year old patient and this is the arterial zoria that we highlighted in the previous sessions as well. In the previous sessions, we mentioned clearly that how to recognize the arterial zoria, how to document arterial zoria, how to overcome the two problems with the arterial zoria, how to reach the coronaries, and how to finish your BCI or diagnostic coronary angiography from arterial lesoria, which is beyond our task as well today. But also arterial lesoria plays a role in when you compare, when you choose working from right versus left. So definitely subclavian area affect choice, your choice between working from right to the left. Usually the resistance point you may find in right as opposed to the left, two or three resistance points versus one. Tortuosis and loops maybe have two or three, even sometimes uh, two or six times even more in the right as compared to left in 70 or 80 years uh, patients as opposed to the octogenarians. Arterial zoria also may make your life a little bit difficult when you work from right as opposed to the left. Despite we can overcome most of these problems, the higher incidence of course over rate will be expected when you work from right as opposed to the left more radiation and more catheter exit change with less patient satisfaction as well. Look for this patient. This is the 39 year old patient who had a cabbage, but the, she developed a chest pain. CT proved evidence of subclavian artery stenosis. Subclavian artery stenosis, by the way, reported to be in literature approximately 2%. And subclavian artery stenosis in left, it's more than higher, higher than the right, three to 4%. However, in sub-occlusive subclavian artery stenosis, there is no problem to passage your wire or traverse, but in occlusion, definitely you will find a problem as well. And in another study, they reported the incidence of subclavian artery stenosis, 3.5%, and in patients with cabbage, approximately 7%. And in patients with peripheral arterial disease, you do expect that. You have one patient for every five patients having subclavian artery stenosis. So definitely, owing to the subclavian artery segment, left versus radial artery is easier and safe working from left as, as opposed to the right. Uh, going uh, very fast to the uh, literature, the talent trial that uh, compared the left versus right, that showed that there is no significant difference between both except in subclavian artery tertiosis, which, which is, was more or twice as in the right side as opposed to the left side. And there was, significant reduction in only fluoroscopy and procedure time. This was the only uh, difference between uh, the working from left or right. And they found also that for the juniors or the fellows, usually the procedure time is less when you work from the left as opposed to the right, because exactly as Dr. Heder mentioned, the configuration of the left is similar to the femoral one. I want to also throw many literatures. I will uh, summarize in just in one minute. All this literature review, they mentioned clearly that working from left transradial approach was associated with shorter fluoroscopy and the procedure time as talent trial mentioned. And usually no statistically significant difference between them regarding success rate, amount of contrast, number of catheters in hospital major bleeding or maze in hospital or 30, year, 30 days mortality. And the left transradial approach is preferred in patients with prior cabbage because direct access to the left lima. Elderly patients because of the uh, subclavian tortuosis as we mentioned and the short stature patients as well. Also in some literature mentioned right-handed patients, it is better to start from the left transradial approach to avoid any problems in their left hand. And also there is increasing or consumption of the radial approach for the peripheral intervascular intervention for the lower limbs. 
because of the proximity of the left radial approach to the peripheral. So it is shorter using the similar or the available caster right now. The difference can be explained by higher incidence of right radial high takeoff, the radial loops by the subclavian torch wasp as well as arterial misery. So in conclusion right now, right versus left, the cath lab setup, I think we can modify to work comfortably with the left radial approach. Your skill will not affect because we are utilizing the same uh, material, same tool uh, kits, but the patient, I think, differs. Your patient left considered to be a different patient when you are working from the right. Just to conclude, with the appropriate patient assessment and preparation, the right and the left transradial approach are almost equally safe and effective. To be proficient with both approaches, right and left, the operator needs to understand the anatomic differences between both foods, laboratory setup, patient preparation, procedure techniques, and catheter selection is very, very important. And it is recommended that each cardiac catheterization laboratory develops specific protocols to work from right or left transradial uh, approach to enhance safety efficacy, reducing crossover to femoral axis, to acquire more patient satisfaction, successful outcomes from the radial procedures. Thank you so much. Okay, Mansour, thanks very much. Uh, I have a comment or a question to uh, Professor Hashim. Uh, in in post-cabbage patients who got angina, do you prefer to have a multi-slice CT scan to delineate the anatomy before uh, attempting a coronary intervention? Yeah, so, so we use CT scan for multiple uh, use in, in planning. Um, coronary artery bypass grafting is one of them. The second is trying to operate or do PCI on CTOs, on chronic total occlusions, because we've, um, we use some of the abandoned graft to, as a conduit to get us back to the, um, to the coronary arteries. I do use it. However, it's very limited, as you very well know, um, it's very limited by the, the heart rhythm. Patients with atrial fibrillation, it becomes very hard to do CT and geography. Um, you need to have a very blocked heart rate between 650 to 70 taps, preferably at 60 beats per minute to get good quality, especially when you're trying to get an internal mammary uh, that is overlying the lungs. Breathing becomes also an issue. Um, and then the, this, the third thing is, unfortunately, the, high, the, the risk of chronic kidney disease and low GFR, it's always go alongside with patients with coronary artery bypass grafting. So that's another thing to give someone a bolus of 150 cc's or 120 to get a CT angiogram, I probably rather do cath myself and, and then do um, small squirts of, of contrast. But we do use it. And I, if, if patient's suitable, you should definitely do it. Makes life easy. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, the second point, you mentioned atrial fibrillation. Uh, if you are confronted with a patient with atrial fibrillation on vitamin K antagonists, he came to the cath lab with INR 2.4. What, what is your advice? So, so the cutoff based on the quality. If it's a primary PCI, we don't stop. We go in and I would do transradial. Okay. Uh, if it's an n STEMI, uh, or it's unstable angina, we do prefer that we allow some time to wash out. The cutoff here to access the radial artery is 2.0 or below. Um, the cutoff to, to get the, the transfemoral is 1.8 and below. Uh, we've been burned many times with severe uh, retroperitoneal bleeds. That's, that's where we do it. Nowadays, um, if, if it's an unstable angina or an NSTEMI and I have to go in, um, I will uh, probably give a unit or two of FFP, fresh frozen plasma, which is a blood transfusion, a blood product transfusion. Not many patients prefer that, but that's also something we use. There is an antagonist, um, not vitamin K. There is an antagonist for warfarin and for the, um, for the DOAX or the novel uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, which we use. Um, but again, I would 
prefer radial. If your question is, if my INR is 2 O, would I still give heparin? I still give heparin. And I will give heparin the exact same dose I, I, I used. The INR, as you well know, uh, and, and the rest of the, 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 the panel and the attendees know, uh, yes. heparin and Coumadin don't share the same uh, coagulation cascade pathway. So I would still give heparin to prevent catheter um, thrombosis. I hope I Dr. answered. Heider, uh, Dr. Haider, uh, Dr. Samah, if you allow me to ask Dr. Dr. Haider. Uh, I know, Dr. Haider, you <laughs> are, uh, uh, have a lot of experience using the railway oh. system. Uh, if you have time, please, can you give us the step how to use it? This is very important for us. We have it, but we have no experience to use it. Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll fly through my slides then. Can I share my screen for yes, four minutes? Yes, please. I promise. Um, I hate to keep you late. I'm, it's just, um, so um, I'll show this. So this is the major problem. Now, now, if I'm doing diagnostic, I'm using Terumo slender sheath that is four and five, which is the hydrophilic sheath. So I use a four and five sheath uh, because most of my diagnostic catheters are five French. I use that for one reason. I use it in women 65 and older because Dr. Salam just told us, Dr. Masoud just told us that he, the tortuosity, all these things that he described, they're always more prevalent and common in women at that age. So if I know I'm going that way, I'm using four and five and then my wire is in. If I want to bring my guide, this is the railway. It comes in two dilators. There is an O21, this guy, and there's this guy, O35. If you have your O35 wire, leave it in the arm, take your sheath out, and you will bring this dilator in, and I'll show you how to do that. If you are planning to go sheathless guide at the get-go from the beginning, you gain your access with the needle. You use the railway O21 wire, which is the micro wire, and then you put your dilator on it. But to start, if you're trying to learn it, I do recommend you get your access the usual way. You use your O35 wire, and then here we go. You take it out of the sheath. It comes wrapped like this. Then there is a front end, which is tapered, and there is a back end, which is blunt. You flush both. I cannot emphasize this. Very important. You flush them both. Then a very wet gauze, you have to wipe it. It's hydrophilic. It needs to be activated. Now it's lubricaceous. This is your guide you're trying to go in with. So all you have now, a four and five, and an O35 wire. You're gonna take the sheath out. You have, you have to back load, which means the tip of your guide has to ride the blunt end of the dilator. The reason for that is the hydrophilic coating, that lubricaceous material, it's only at the tip. If you go the opposite way, you will scrape it off. And you will see it. It looks like um, it looks like jello, like gelatin. You, you cannot do this. It, it, it get crumbles. You have to backload. So you bring the guide, and the guide will kind of transform it into a sheath and a dilator. This is what I'm doing here. There is a marker. Once you enter the sheath into the the guide into the sheath, when you see the hundred centimeter marker, you stop important and this i'll show you in a second now i took the sheath out now i have a wire and a skin and i have a guide catheter with this much of the dilator stick through do you see this i, I hope you got the visualization so the, the wire yes. is in the body this is very hydrophilic it's sharp like a knife it's very it's a very well designed dilator the razor effect right here, it's almost seamless. Like you could run your fingers on it, you won't feel the bump. 
it is almost like butter. It's very smooth. Exactly. That's how it feels. Once you get that in, you go all the way up. You have to make the change. So you track it. It's going up. You see the tip of the guide. You know that there is at least 10 centimeter of the dilator. You have to stop at the subclavian. Do not take the dilator into the descending, into the ascending aorta. You will dissect it because that is very sharp. So you stop right here on the straight segment. Once you are, again, most of the problem is down here. Once you're in the axillary subclavian junction, life is totally fine. We put impella, we put 16 French sheath through here. So that's safe. But the minute you get the subclavian, take the dilator out, you have a wire and a guide, you push it down. I hope that was sufficient. Yes, excellent, excellent demonstration, Dr. Haider. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'll stop sharing. Any other questions from the attendees? I see something on the uh, chat. It's, it's, uh, I have a quote from one of our colleagues in London. Uh, he is appreciating uh, the meeting and appreciating the talks. So uh, thanks him very much. Uh, Assam, would you like to add anything, Assam? It's very nice and uh, very nice talk. Dr. Hashim. Uh, nothing. We had it. Thank you. Perfect. Just a question to uh, Dr. Kurashim. Yes, sir. You are, uh, we are using the 0.5 left catheter, Jatkin left catheter in the right as opposed to the left. What is the explanation for that? So, no, so, so you are, my recommendation, if I'm in the right radial, to engage the left main coronary artery, I use JL35. I'll tell you what the explanation. We're trying to accommodate because you're coming against the aortic arch. The aortic arch is favorable from the left and from the femoral because the catheter hugs the lesser curvature of the aorta than the upper curvature. Um, when you're coming from the brachiocephalic, there is a awkward takeoff because you, it's not an arch anymore. There's an elbow. So for that elbow, instead of modifying the catheter, if you bring the catheter to a smaller size, you will sit like this into the aortic root. And that will make you reach the left coronary cusp and the left um, coronary artery easier. For the right, it doesn't matter because even if there's an elbow, the catheter will engage the brachiocephalic all the way out into the left side of the aorta, aortic wall, and then we'll bring the JR4 back into the RCA. So JR4, do not change. JL35 is important. Okay, great. Unless you have an aortic root dilatation or great. your patient is taller than, I have to do the math, six, six, we use feet here. So six feet, um, that's taller than 180 centimeters. Great. Very nice. Cool. I left my email in the presentation. If it's recorded, anyone feel free to email me anytime and I will try to get to you uh, promptly. I promise. Questions related to transradial, non transradial, more than happy to be of help. Thank you, Dr. Haider. And, uh, and the, inshallah, the coming meeting, uh, we will, you will be with us. Uh, uh, if there is any complex BCI intervention, calcific lesions, if we'll use rota, uh, which kind of rota or laser, because we have no experience in laser, uh, but in some places we have rota. So uh, for sure, uh, we will be so proud to be with us in the coming meeting, inshallah. Anytime, pleasure, no worries. Dr. Next, Dr. Next, Sam, session, next session, inshallah, Dr. Heather will uh, discuss the uh, complications dedicated to the radial uh, approach. Sure. Uh, we'll discuss many uh, issues of these uh, perforation, hematomas, uh, radial artery occlusion. We would like to cover, if you have time, we will be very, very happy to have you. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll try to log in, I promise. Okay. Perfect. Uh, actually, it, it is time to announce that we still have uh, two talks in this uh, course, and we will arrange very soon uh, a bifurcation course 
So uh, we will, uh, I'll be in touch, uh, Dr. Hashim. So you will share us with uh, the bifurcation course uh, together with our colleagues here. Actually, it was my pleasure uh, to see you tonight. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to know that you are uh, Iraqian. فده شرف لينا وسعادة لينا صحيح فأهلا بحضرتك وربنا يبارك فيك وفي علمك وينفع بيك إن شاء الله الله يطول عمرك شكرا جزيلا شكرا على الإضافة thank you هن هنسيب بقى كل واحد يقول ال ال last comment sure تفضل تفضل تروح هاش تفضل شكرا شكرا جزيلا I I really I really enjoyed you guys up to par uh, you, you're doing great things already. Um, there's not much to teach you in all honesty or, or even to share any other experience. You, you are up to date with the literature, you're doing great. Um, all the cases you showed are complex. It is almost from our daily practice here in the United States. Um, more than happy, uh, I, I do appreciate it and, uh, and it's an honor for me to join. Thank you so much. Thank you. Assam? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samah and uh, Dr. Mansour, Dr. Abdul, Abdul Mansour. And Dr. Haider, we have enjoyed and uh, your uh, presentation and uh, your experience. Uh, I am very happy and uh, you are talking to Zair Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Abdul Mansour. Yeah, I, I'm so happy that we, I am with uh, all my professor and my dear friend, Dr. Haider, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mansour, and uh, Dr. Haider, we enjoyed your talk so much. And please keep us, keep you with us in the coming uh, session and meeting. We will enjoy your talks as usual. Thank you so much. Thank you. Personal Khatem. لا حضرتك بقى حسن الختام ان شاء الله ناشنا كل عمر هتختم but I would like to express my extreme pleasure and joy by this talks by this gathering by moderators speakers it was a fantastic session as usual and ان شاء الله we do expect that which will happen in the last two sessions ان شاء الله so حسن الختام دكتور سامح اللهم اجعل هذا العمل خالصا لوجهك الكريم وإن شاء الله الثواب لك منصور وكتر خيرك وإن شاء الله نلتقي عبد المقصود في البيفوركيشن بروجرام وكورس قريب إن شاء الله شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا يلا باي باي السلام عليكم